it's not as it should be, but they're <laughs> not. Um, I'd like, first of all, I'll ask Chris to come up. You just want to say a few words and then... Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick ad in advertising. Uh, you might like have a commercial break for you. Um, uh, come back actually a few years ago, I wrote a, a book on Psalm 26, which is uh, sometimes really in heaven's life. Uh, it was published earlier this year, uh, but very fresh off the press. Normal price is £8, but you might want £5. <coughs> I could leave some here, but I've got a few with you. But uh, please come and see my wife, well, that's my business manager. Um, <laughs> 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 um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with if you're interested, it only takes one morning a uh, month. So if you are interested in helping, if you can see Alan and um, he will give you information like that. And the third thing, I'll probably embarrass her, but can we say happy birthday to Olivia, who is 18 today. <laughs>
3, verses 1 to 18. I'll just read these. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. What an amazing God we have. Amen. Let's stand to sing. <laughs> you can't do any of this. Yeah. Yeah. Walk amongst yourselves. <laughs> we will have that God for living. Two So our first song is Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Um, and the last verse says, Father like, he tends and spares us, where our feeble frame he knows. In his hand he gently bears us, rescues us. Angels who behold him face to face, sun and moon and all in time and space, praise him, praise him.
from children towards their dads. Dad, I wish I'd inherited your ability to fall asleep anywhere, anytime. <laughs> um, I'm smiling because I have you as a dad. I'm laughing because you can't do anything about it. <laughs> Dad, thanks for saying yes when Mum said no. <laughs> I wouldn't trade my dad for anything. Then again, no one has offered me anything yet. <laughs> my dad taught me everything he knows. That's why I know everything. <laughs> um, and then uh, from Dad, Dad's got the children, um, children, I think. Life doesn't come with instructions, oh, sorry, but it does come with a dad who always answers my calls. Oh, that's quite sweet. Ben, I think this is a um, dad's about their children. Pro tip, learn how to fix toys by removing the batteries. <laughs> when I was a child, I said to my father one afternoon, Daddy, would you take me to the zoo? He answered, if the zoo wants you, let them come and get you. <laughs> Raising children is the only job where you work 24 hours a day and it actually costs you money. <laughs> the key to being an awesome dad is ageing without maturing. <laughs> I think that is it. So yeah. just a few points there. Um, you know, the kind of relationship we have or had with our physical father varies, especially these days, which is rather sad. Um, but one thing is sure, I'm sure we all want or have wanted to make our parents proud. And the question I ask myself is, um, we've read about our Heavenly Father, and I just ask myself, do I make my Heavenly Father proud? Is he pleased with me? Do I obey him? I know I fail him so often. Things I say, my attitudes, um, and yet I know he still loves me no matter what. So let's sing, Father in heaven, how we love you. Now, we sang this song many years ago in Holiday Club, 
and I'm not going to sing it that quickly, and I'm not sure we'll have time to do all the actions. It's called Tiny Little Me, and it talks um, about, you know, that God has time for me no matter what. So, um, it might be new to some of you, but we will take it slowly <laughs> so we can get all the words in. <laughs> If you want to make up your actions, then please do so. There are some elephants in here, spiders and buffaloes, so... <laughs>
Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, If you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths, and commit yourselves to the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and Ashtoreths, and served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. And when the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a young lamb and sacrificed it as a burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such panic that they were routed before the Philistines, before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shem. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Father, we just thank you that we have this wonderful privilege of meeting together in the fellowship of believers. But I just thank you that it strengthens me so much to come on a Sunday in a fellowship to hear your word, to sing your praises, Lord. We're of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people 
belonging to God. What a privilege that is. Now, Father, I just thank you for the fellowship here and your people and the blessing they are to me in these days in which we live. Thank you, Father. And Lord, may we all show forth your love this coming week as we live with Jesus. Amen. 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 Lord, we do pray for our nation, the election coming. Lord, that we might, as a nation, turn back to God, Lord. We have a Christian heritage. We know that not all we're Christians, but our principles are living. The guidance we saw was based on your word, the Bible. And we do pray as a nation we will turn back to God. We know this will be such a blessing. And Lord would resolve many of our problems. Bless us, Lord. Touch lives today, we pray. May we all be wise in all we do. Please help us, Lord. But we pray above all, you will raise up men and women who are prepared to stand for Jesus in these days and proclaim this wonderful message of salvation that we have. Amen. Amen.
And Lord, we desire to see that more and more. Lord. We pray particularly for things that are affecting this community at this time. We just pray for your wisdom in those situations. And pray that we will show your love and <coughs> lives and situations that we, we can reach out to. But I would pray particularly for the beings as we have the uh, rounders match next week. Lord, we again just ask that you will use that group to your group. Lord, that you will bring in the right people to be part of that group. Lord, we thank you for those who come and work with you. And Lord, we pray that you will bring <coughs> But we recognise that in our society there are so many children and people who are lacking with the confidence or the um, need perhaps to go out and become part of the community. Lord, we <coughs> give this to you. And when we pray that our church will be a blessing to them, we pray, and they will find you for themselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
we have uh, stories in our household when our son was born, we couldn't decide on a name. Uh, in those days, you had books that you could look to, and they could tell you what names meant. These days, with the advent of the internet and the increase in use of the internet, you can find out who are the most popular men, one of the most popular names. And I don't know, but Olivia's uh, parents were clearly transit. Because the last two years, the most popular name for a young lady born in the UK is Olivia. And we're, we're very aware of that ourselves, because one of our granddaughters, or our granddaughter is called Olivia, but she lives in America, so it's not really relevant, but popular in the UK. But names are very, very unfortunate. And at the end of the reading, we had a name. A name that originally just meant a thing, but had become much more well known as the name of a person from one of Charles Dickens' books. Um, and I must confess, I grew up not in a Christian home. So to me, Ebenezer just was that rather strange man in, in the Christmas Carol. Um, and I knew nothing about it. When I first came across Christians singing about raising their Ebenezers, <laughs> when was the last time you raised your Ebenezer in song? In, uh, on, I, I, I have no idea what people were talking about. I thought it was crazy, it was nuts. Uh, but it comes from a lovely, lovely head. It says, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure, safely, to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering in the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interpose his precious love. I was reading this passage, and that name came up again um, as I was reading it a few weeks ago, but it wasn't the name that Grant told me, it was the number. I think you saw that in uh, verse 2. It was a long time, 20 years. In all. I want to do this morning is look what happened. Well, actually, I've already had half my sermon taken away from me this morning, so thank you. Uh, I thought you'd name was something that was reading for you. They introduced it so well that the, one of the, the preparations already been done with. We're going to look at that again. Then we're going to look at what happened at that 20 year period. And then we're going to look at what happened afterwards. And as we were rightly reminded, the stone does lead us back. Lead us back. This again we use a bit of Charles Dickens. In one of his books, he talks about the best of times and the worst of times. Well, actually, for the people of Israel, it was the worst of times, and then potentially the best of times. The worst of times, a time when they were at war with the neighbours and the first ones. A time when they had a great, a cunning plan. Uh, if you go back to chapter 4 and verse 3, they say, let us... Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the first time? Let us bring the ark of the Lord. The Lord's come from Shiloh, so that it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. The idea that having God's, the symbol of God's presence, would somehow give them extra strength, extra victory, it would seem like a good idea. But sadly, it turned out to be their idea. It wasn't God's. Idea. The Philistines thought that they were going to lose because the Ark of the Covenant had been uh, part of the portion of the people. And so in chapter 4, uh, verses 7 and 8, and 15, verse 7, uh, when they learned that the uh, 6 and 7, when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. And God has come out into the camp, they said. We're in trouble. Um, I wonder if you were the international. It says, God has come into the camp. Oh no! Nothing like this has happened before. We are doomed. <laughs> and um, those of a certain age, you have to put images of dad's army and death. Uh, um, and um, they weren't. Because they, the people of Israel hadn't consulted God. They just thought it was a good idea. And it wasn't God's idea. And so they suffered defeat, they suffered disaster, they ran away. <coughs> and the Ark of the Covenant was taken into captivity. And then we have a second name. The end of, uh, towards the end of chapter 4. A name that made the glory of part of God's people. 
the leader of the people that Eli died, his two sons were killed, and one of his daughters in law gave birth. And in chapter 4, verse 21, the glory has departed from Israel, so she named the boy Ichabod. Again, probably never going to be one of the top ten popular names in England or in any other country around the world. And that's where they ended up. Total disaster. They lost that symbol of God's presence. They lost her. They, they, they were defeated. They were in rout. But God had not met them. And so chapter 5 and 6 remind us that God was still involved. God was still caring for his people. The Philistines took the ark of the covenant, placed it in the temple of their God. The next morning, they turned, came to the temple and found that the statue of their God was bowing down, had fallen to the ground, bowing down before God's sin, of God's true God's presence. And that happened again. It got worse. So they took the ark away and took it to two cities, to Jan, Gaza, and Ekron. And each one then came under the, gun, the judgment of God. And as we were reminded, the Philistines then returned the ark to the people of Israel. They gave an offering to go with it because they could not stand to be under God's judgment. Today we were reminded that Psalm 95 tells us that God is a great God, He's a king above all gods. That God is the sovereign king. And as we come to God this morning, as we spend time in his presence, we worship him, worshiping him, we're reminded that God is still <coughs> the sovereign king. He's the ruler of the universe. And whatever is going on in this world, that does not change. We have an election. We've been reminded of the need to pray for the wars that are going on in Ukraine, in Gaza. And in Israel, and other places around the world, God is still the sovereign king in these difficult days, in these uncertain days. We've also been reminded, too, haven't we, that 80 years ago, a great event took place. The people of the UK and America and Canada <coughs> fought. It was battles on D Day and the uh, following uh, events through Normandy. After four years, four long years of war, there was hope again on the horizon. And throughout that period of war, God's people in this country and other places called down to God. And indeed, I'm going to think about it a bit in a moment, because uh, on the very eve of D-Day, Eisenhower said this to his troops who were going to the sailors, the airmen, I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will expect the less the full victory. And let us beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble <coughs> They trusted that God could bring victory and what would appear to be disaster. And God brought victory there to the people of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was returned. We're reminded that God is the sovereign king, but also that he is the one who remains involved in the world of his making. He's not aloof. He's not far away. It's interesting coming into a school situation. I remember some years ago going to a, a, an exhibition of school, uh, children's religious art in the Winchester Cathedral. And we're looking around, and there was that hoary old caricature. God sitting on a cloud, the divorce, the way from the world of his making. But this is a passion that reminds us that God is involved. He took the issue. He made sure that the people of the Philistines learned that he was the true sovereign God. He was the one who enabled that ark to be returned without the intervention of the people of Israel themselves. Because God took the initiative and God brought victory out of defeat. No longer were there people of Ichabod. The glory departed. The glory had returned because the ark had come back to its rightful place among God's people. That's what happened. And then we had the 20 years. And we are told in the uh, verse 2 that 20 years was a significant period. It was a long period. 
virtually every translation had come. It was a long time. Now, some of us are getting a bit older, and the years do seem to fly by, but they no, no used to. But 20 years for all of us is a long time. For some, it's longer than our lives. For some, it's a quarter of our lives. For some, it's... Oh, you know how that is, but it's a long time. But through that long time, it's slightly unclear as to what was happening. The newer translation says, then. So you don't get any sense of what happens at all during the 30, 20 years. Some of the older translations say that throughout that period, God's people were lamenting. That very literal translation is wailing. So that they were lamenting or they were calling out to God, the translation varied. And I wonder where we are. Do we lament? I gave that quote from my uh, Eisenhower a little while ago. And I know in my heart there is a lament that goes on. That if only that was what was happening today. We've been back to a period that seems to have passed. During the Second World War, there were a number of days of national, national days of prayer. I wonder if any of our political leaders put in their manifestos. Wouldn't it be good to do exactly what Isaiah said, uh, Eisenhower said, to beseech the, the, the blessing of Almighty God upon whatever we can do? As Christians, we don't have this man. It wouldn't be wonderful if that were true of our nation. I think I saw in the headlines that our current Prime Minister made reference to his Hindu faith. There's only been some of his actions. In the debate of our Christian leaders, confirmed that. And I feel that by wailing, a longing, a lamenting, which you don't believe in days when that is very real, as part of the national picture that we live in. But I'm challenged. Would not be better than what I was now said. Would not be better myself beseeching the blessing of Almighty God on our land. It's great to hear you do that this morning. May we be people who do really beseech the blessing of Almighty God. Because that is the great need of our country. We have political leaders who have some power. When we pray, we come to the God who has all power. And he is the God who remains the sovereign king. And it's uncertain what would happen in the 20 years, but what we do know is that very clearly as we look at the difference between uh, any verse 2 and verse 3, that there was something that they were not doing. They were not getting it. Right. And that was dreadfully sad. Because God had won a victory for them. God had brought the ark back. God had given them so much to look forward to. And yet, and I wonder if that's true for us. We know that God has stepped into this world. We know that God came into the world in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has not left us alone. He is still involved. We still have a man in the glory. We have a saviour who is beside his heavenly father, sitting on his throne. He is ruling, he is reigning. And one day that full moon will be seen. Does that mean it's complete? Does that give us assurance that we can't? Or perhaps we're better at waiting and lamenting rather than truly seeing God. Because Sam, Samuel then challenges the people. He said, if you are truly seeking God, this is what you must do. And what he does is he uses a challenge in the same way that others have done in the Old Testament. Think of Joshua. He said, choose you today. Who are you going to serve? Here is Samuel. He says this. If you are truly returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the asterisks and commit yourselves to the Lord to serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hands 
of the Philistines. Been carrying on in my readings, um, and I've got to the time of Solomon. And when we read about Solomon, we're told he wasn't fully committed to God. Unlike his father David, I think um, the affairs of the been to walk through the Bible, they talk about David being wholehearted and Solomon being half hearted. And that's what the people were like. Yes, they claimed to be followers of God, but they still had the foreign gods alongside them. Yes, they claimed to be followers of God, but they walked in ways that were more like the people around them who were not followers of God. And that same thing, the idea of putting something down, putting something away, and putting on something which is new, is something to reflect in again and again in the New Testament. I sometimes talk about them as pajama verses. Um, if it needs explaining, when we got up this morning, most of us would be wearing some sort of night attire. Now I am hoping that before you came to church, you took that off <laughs> and then put on the clothes that were appropriate for the day. I remember a story once of a, a, a boy's camp. And um, one of the boys was embarrassed. And he didn't take his pajamas off. Anyway. <coughs> By about the Tuesday, the other boys in his tent were beginning to object. Towards the end of the week, those objections got very strong. Because he hadn't taken off the things that he should have taken off before pushing on and trying to put on the things he put on. In Hebrews, we're told to lay aside every weight of the sin that so easily entangles to run the race that lies before us. In Romans, we're told this. So it's in Romans chapter 13. Let us, yes, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, nor in dissension and dis uh, disputing. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to glorify the desires of the sinful nature. I wonder what our lives are truly like. <coughs> Are we people who are wholehearted in our passion to follow Christ? <coughs> or do we have our own things that make us draw us away from Christ? Things that are effectively foreign gods. They may be gods of pleasure. They may be gods of possession. They may be gods that make us want to look good in other people's eyes. Or are we so everything other than the things that will allow us to follow Christ and follow him holy consciously, holy, utterly committed to him. Because when the people of Israel did that, victory came. A victory that came first and foremost because God responded to their commitment and he acted. Read in verse uh, 10 of uh, 1 Samuel 7, when Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage in Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. He was God who acted. God responded to their commitment responded to their determination to follow him, responded to their desire that they would put him and him only at the heart of their lives. And as he responded, we won the victory. The enemy were routed. And that's where they come to. They recognise that. And then they set up this stone, this stone of remembrance, this stone of help to remind themselves that God is a God who is at work. And 
I wonder when we look back in our lives, when we look to this past week, what things have we got to remind us of, of God's goodness? Because God hasn't changed. The Bible is very clear about that. The God who brought help those thousands of years ago is still the God who is helping. The God who stepped into this world in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring salvation, to bring hope when there was despair, to bring light and darkness. He is still the same God today. What are we able to look to? To recognise that God is God. I want to just tell you one story of a lady whose funeral I took just a week or so ago. She'd been brought up in Sunday school. She knew the reality. She had it in her brain, the reality of who God was. She knew the stories of the Lord Jesus Christ. She knew what he had come to do, some of the parables she told. But she drifted away for many, many years to a very difficult, very dark place. Then she came back to church in her late 50s, early 60s. We'd seen her moved in the church, seen her heart touched with one particular man gave his testimony. But she'd been moved but not changed. And then over the last few years, we talked about various things. And I gave her this book, the Why Jesus book, to read. And in that book, there is a prayer. And we talked about that prayer. A prayer that says, I'm sorry for things I have done wrong in my life. And she and I are almost laughed because it says, take a few moments to ask his forgiveness for anything particular that's on your conscience. For her life was such that a few moments would not have done it. It would have taken much, much longer. <coughs> And she used to ask two questions. The first was, why am I still alive? She was now in her early 80s. And she had seen family members, friends, all taken into attention, but she was still alive. We talk about the promises that God made that he is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. And she could begin to understand that. And then she asked another question, but, but have I done so much that I can't begin with? Can I begin with you? So we left it. And she had this book that we talked about it, but she not made any real evidence that she responded. And then she went into hospital. Very, very ill. <coughs> with the possibility that she would die. And in the hospital, her son was told that she was going to die that night, or one night. I really felt that there was some unfinished business. I'm afraid that she would have the chance to talk, I'd have the chance to talk to her again. And she survived. And we talked. And when we talked, she gave some very clear indications that she had taken those prayers and made them real. She made that decision to follow Christ. She had all those opportunities there for 80 years. She missed out so much. The God in His goodness reached down to her at the very end of her life. And I trust, I hope it's not wishful thinking, I trust that she's now with her Father in heaven. The people have waited for 20 years. They've wasted 20 years when God had already shown them his goodness. And there are people around us, people that we know, who know about the reality that there is a God in heaven, who know about the reality that Jesus came into this world, but they're not doing anything about it. They're not truly putting their trust in him. But when they did, the people found that victory came. When they did, all God's promises came true. When they did, they were rescued and restored and they were able to say, God's helped us. God's helped us. Can I suggest
suggest there are five things we can learn from this passage. First thing is we should expect God to help. Are we expectant people? Because God is still the God who helps. We should expect to be able to say, I can remember how God helped me then, and I remember how God <coughs> is helping me now. And I should expect to be able to say, I can remember and I can look forward to God, how God is going to help me in the days that I have. That's the first thing we should be expecting people. The second thing is we should be praying people. It's God who helps. It's God who won the victory. It's God who stepped in. We're actually drawing this to our knees. We can't quite manage it on our knees. Sit down and pray. But we should be down before God. We should affect our knees. The third thing is we should expect to affect our eyes. We have a Saviour who's in heaven. It's a lovely old hymn. And so the same tempts me to despair. And tells me with the guilt within, up and over, and seek him there, who made an end of all my sin. Are we people who are looking up, looking to our Saviour, looking to him, because he is the one who remains gloriously, powerfully, wonderfully, our Saviour King in heaven, until the day when he returns? Do we look to him for hope? Do we look to him for encouragement? Do we look to him for life? The fourth thing though is to actually affect our hearts. Because knowing where he is, knowing who he is, will actually give us a security and a certainty that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God and in Christ Jesus. It should affect our hearts and give us a, a secure foundation for our lives. But also it should mean that our hearts want to respond and reflect that love that we've come to know to experience. Because finally, it should affect our lives and our lives. Because we've got a message to tell to the nations. We have a message to give to the nations that the Lord who reigneth above has sent his Son to save us and show us that God is love. And as we go, as we tell, as we're involved, we're, we're hearing prayers for the activities that are going on through the work of this church in the coming days. As we go to share the love of Christ, we know that we're not going alone. <coughs> because God is still the God who is involved. God is still the God who cares for the world he's making. God is still the God who longs that everyone should come to repentance. So when we meet again next Sunday, what will we say about how God has helped us in this week? As we look forward to the weeks and the months that lie ahead until the Lord returns, what stone of remembrance are we going to place to remind ourselves of who God is and how God helps us for His glory and for the honour? of his son, our
we might know of him, <coughs> but do we actually know him personally? And also let's just give our lives to him so that he can use our lives to glorify him. We all meet different people. And so God can use each one of us in different situations. That's why we're all different. <coughs> So let's just commit our lives to him this morning and ask him to help us in the week ahead. Unless he comes or calls us home in the meantime. So Father, as we are here, our heads bowed before you because you are the almighty God. Father, oh, forgive us for the times when we have let you down. Thank you that you still love us no matter what. And help us by your spirit to live our lives according to your plan for each one of us. It will be different for each one of us and we thank you for that. Help us to just show your love to others as we meet them this week. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. Um, should anyone need prayer at the end of the service, then um, <coughs> just make a way to the prayer corner. Someone will pray with God and it does all of them.
have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. Well, this morning we read, this far has the Lord helped us and he will continue to help us. So Father, we just thank you for what you said to us this morning. Pray that you will give us uh, your spirit to go out in strength and in power to live our lives. For we, the glory belongs to you. Amen. Amen. Um, Phoebe's going to bring a few things around to two men in our midst. <laughs> <laughs>